was sitting in a car uh, on my way actually here on the German highway, driving 150 kilometers, and suddenly a song popped up on the radio by Madonna, of all people, who was singing uh, about a material world and that she was a material girl. And suddenly it sort of hit me that she was right. That's what we live in, because it seems, eh, like a lot of speakers have addressed already, um, that the world that we live in is sort of shifting eh, from analog to digital. You know, there might have been a time that our social identity would have been based on uh, which side of the Berlin Wall we would have been living, east or west, or which kind of church we would have gone to, or these kind of things. But maybe today we live in a world, in a very exciting world, in a very hybrid world, which is more about how many Facebook friends do we have, how fast is our modem. And within this relational context, you know, a la Facebook, a la Hives, a la LinkedIn, a la Twitter, technology is more and more used to connect, to interact, to create, to communicate with each other and to, to reinterpretate this reality. And I'm sort of fascinated by that element in a way. So technology is maybe not so much something which is hidden inside an iPhone or, or tucked away in a notepad or in an iPad, for God's sake. But it's more and more about, about social interactions, how we sort of see ourselves, how we communicate with each other, how we perceive reality. And as an artist slash architect slash designer slash inventor, I've always believed that art in itself should have the goal to reconnect, to engage people in some kind of emotional or spiritual or semi-functional type of way. And I also more and more or less believe that we are creating this virtual world. We're actually spending a lot of time on it, eh? like adding the content. But at the same hand, we are material people. We are tactile people, and they're sort of drifting away these worlds. I think we're sort of, in a way, getting disconnected from that as well. And um, the, the, the key questions we have to answer, which there are many, um, are about how to replug, how to reinterpretate these two worlds, and how to sort of make this new type of interactive, sustainable worlds which are necessary. I think that's sort of, the in, within a nutshell, the, 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 the food for thought I had in my, my brain for the last four years. And as an artist, I mean, this is what I do. I make stuff. Eh? I, I try to materialize them. And that's why I started my own studio three or four years ago. This is Studio Rose Garden, a 500 square meter just outside Rotterdam. Um, five years ago, I started alone, and now it's actually a company with uh, 10 people. Some are like, the half of them are great whiskets, software and electronic engineers. We develop our own technology. And the other are more like uh, designers, sometimes more products, sometimes more fashion. And together we work on what I like to call series of interactive landscapes, objects react to the sounds and emotion of the people walking by, in order to make sort of art which is never finished, which actually is open for the input of, uh, yeah, of basically of you guys. Yeah. And this is one of our, our best friends actually uh, right there. This is like a mini computer. So all the, all the artworks that I'm going to show you are sort of uh, packed with this kind of stuff. So there's a microchip in the middle. You flash the software in, and that harbors the bits and the bytes of the software code, which actually gives the behavior. And basically, it's maybe not so much about technology. I think that's really a misunderstanding. But we're much, much more interested in sort of showing how this world is shifting and how it will start to look like, in a way, and what will it generate. And in that way, it's the same like the famous Ruisdaal and the Cuckoo painters, eh? who maybe not so much were interested in realism, but more and more how reality was changing, eh? like the influence of people and city on nature. It was about shifting realities, maybe not so much how it looked like, but more where it towards it was going. And basically, this is the type of landscape we're working on right now. <laughs> this is our reality, or at least this is my reality. It's funny, someone uh, recently, one of the curators called them sort of artifacts from the future, which I like very much in a way. This is a piece we did for the uh, Rotterdam 2007 for the Architectural Biennale. Basically, we're, we're more and more interested to, to engage within the, the, the life of today. You know, I prefer to have an ugly parking garage somewhere than, than, than a white cube uh, exhibition, actually, to be honest. And this was Maas Tunnel, made in 1942 by Van der Steur, actually built during Second World War, and one of the greater monuments of, of progress and, 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 and next level. Um, but nowadays, um, 
people find it quite find it quite scary to walk there eh? because although there are a lot of guards and people cleaning it up a lot of people sort of avoid to go there and we thought it was a perfect place to sort of make a second skin a second layer which would interact with the people on a daily base so basically um, you see here a bit I have a movie here can you push play um, a movie about how June is working so there there are different interactions or different moods yes thank you so basically, it's, this is quite nice that you can touch it as well. Where you walk by, it sort of lights up. This is, of course, very passive. But at the same time, people also want more. And here it's more connecting to the sounds. And what I like about, and what we always work a lot on, is that it has a mind of its own. So it's on one hand, it's a mirror reacting to what you do. But here you see it was quite hectic of all the sounds. And then slowly it's sort of merging itself in again. Or here it tries to connect to people, eh, this ghost of light, how we call it, which sort of plugs people together. So on one hand, it sort of shows you what you're doing, like a mirror. But on the other hand, it will always try to provoke or to engage you in more as a display, more a different mediator. And the highest form, I think, of technology is when it becomes intuitive. Eh? When people feel that they are a part of, of, of the patterns which are merged within all the, all the codings and electronics. And you don't see the technology, it's more there to be experienced. It's more part of your second skin. Come back anytime. And what was fascinating for me was like, what happens when this technology that we find so interesting, eh, we spend so much time on, what happens when it jumps out of the computer screen and becomes like this extension of who we are? And how can we use it maybe not just to make something which is faster or slimmer or eh, the, 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 the Steve Jobs uh, BS story that we hear all the time, which we have to believe in, but how can we actually use it more to create or to mediate or to socialize or to connect people in a new way, in a public way as well? And June was actually one of the first examples of that, of, of, of tactile interfaces. And this was funny, what happens when you put these things in a public space? <laughs> you get people, uh, you get things that you cannot imagine as a designer. And eh, of course you have a wide brain, but still things happen. And this was one of the things that occurred there. After a couple of weeks, wedding couples would go there uh, to have their wedding photos taken. It became a hotspot. And, and, and um, uh, on one hand, kitsch, on the other hand, pure beauty, eh, somehow. Let, let's leave it up to you to, to judge. Um, but it's beautiful that within a dark, empty, more or less dirty tunnel, um, suddenly new behavior was activated. And these are the stories that the guards still tell me when I walk by. And that's fascinating that what these kind of interactive, of what a good, true interactive artwork does is that it starts generating things without itself, and that it's sort of what it generates is sometimes maybe even more interesting than, than the thing itself. I think that, that's where the magic starts kicking in. But the fun part about June was is that we built it just because we wanted to do, you know, there was no business plan. I didn't even know what that word meant, to be honest. And we started to build it, but suddenly we got a lot of requests, a lot of proposals, a lot of like from all over the world to exhibit it. That. It sort of hit something within the brains of the people. And we are Dutch, eh? so we are Dutch designers, so we are pragmatic. I mean, that's one of the main qualities we have as a, as a Dutch people. Um, 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 so, so, so we became fascinated of how to sort of, on one hand, talk about this futurism, about this new world, about the sensual side of technology, but on the other hand, to be pragmatic, you know, to, to, to make it as a modular system with a plug, sensors, put it in a crate, 10 meter per crate, and we ship it. And that's what we started to do, and we did it so that we would save all this time on logistics and, 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 and like, would it work or not? No, 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 make a solid artwork, you know, really re-engineer everything. And we would start making interactive landscape and engage within different settings. In a way, it would become storytelling. Here it's placed in the Dutch Media Art Institute in Amsterdam, in the, in the main corridor. Or here in the, in the castle of Harry Potter in Durham, where we placed... 30-meter strip within the, the cloister uh, corridors. And actually, these are the choir children. Actually, still it's still being used. Eh? So people had suddenly had the idea. It was this, this light. Eh? It became spiritual. You have to believe in it. That's what they told to each other. <laughs> um, and sort of while it was traveling and while it sort of invaded different types of scenarios, also the work sort of 
was reinterpreted because of the context. Eh? In a mass tunnel, you feel it differently than within this, this spiritual environment. But also the scene grew. It sort of moved away from, you know, whiz kids behind laptops uh, doing click and cut uh, mu music, you know, like the, 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 the very abstract stuff. But it, it grew much bigger than that. Like here, the Tate Modern show we did in, in 2007 in a publication about the social sides of technology and how we can engage with that. And what fascinating was, was the social, the cultural element, how people would reinterpret it in based on where they lived. Like here, the children in the city hall in Hong Kong, where we exhibited it for a couple of weeks, would sort of copy the soundscape of June in order to communicate with each other. <laughs> and I was there as a chaperone. So in, in, in sort of, instead of saying in Chinese that they found a new mood or that if they would clap one time, it would do something different than five times, things like that, that we put in a lot, they would actually start to copy these sounds in order to, to show it to each other, like bloop, 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 in, in this complete acceptance of this artificial landscape. And people in LA are much more used to sort of expose themselves. Eh? It became like this extension of their ego for them. But in, in Slovenia or in other ex-dictatorship countries like Portugal, eh? not so maybe 50, 40 years ago, they sort of felt more threatened within their privacy because suddenly they had something which was reacting to them, you know, and they, they were sort of afraid that it would, would spy on them or, you know, take some sounds or record their, their voices. Something we really found very, very intriguing. Um, so what we did is learn from that and actually evolve the codes of patterns we put in it in, in order to make it more, yeah, basically more intuitive. And one day we got a call, which we're in a way we were always waiting for, because exhibitions are great, and, and I've been doing that with a lot of pleasure for in the last three years. But one day we got the call to make a permanent version, to do sort of long-term relationship with, with you guys, with the audience. And um, this is, was the location we decided for the city of Rotterdam, on an old dike. They had to build a new one a little bit 200 meters to the left, because the river is going uh, up, eh? there's more water. So this old dike is not being used anymore. And that's allowed us actually to, to be able to build on it. They're very protective uh, towards these, uh, their dikes, these Dutch. Um, um, and we found it was very interesting because it had this very intense relation with the river Maas. And at the same time, it was a neighborhood with a lot of people who saw June and actually contacted me that they wanted to have it there. And we were struggling for three years with, with license and, and, and city, you know how it goes. A big project, they always take enormous amounts of time. But I loved it because it became sort of like a catwalk, a walk of light within that, starting these SimCity blocks, these prototypes for the client, upgraded to make it more robust, waterproof, all these things, so that it would work and, and remain working in, in the years it had to come. And this is actually how it's placed right now. You can, you can take your car and go there tonight. Uh, lift, just outside the picture is Erasmus Bridge, 60 meter of June, placed beside the river, really trying to merge nature and technology Within a, within, a, within a normal setting. And this is filmed from, from the apartments from above where the people live. So you see people sort of walking by. Eh? When, they, when they start running, it becomes more dynamic in a way. And here you go, so where you walk, it becomes light. You hear the sound of the river as well. But here it has a mind of its own as well. Sometimes it's sort of ignoring you, and then it's like catching up again. <laughs> Which we really like. And so according to different type of people, it would become more or less active. Um, like the game of life, eh, which creates different patterns when you add more, more options. Well, more or less, it's similar like that. But really beautiful how, how people feel that it becomes alive in a way. These kind of artworks need a certain setting. Huh? I mean, um, uh, we are working actually on three large public artworks in Almere as well, and then uh, and in Assen and in Breda, and then it has to be a, a lot more r robust, a much more like, a, how do you say it, hufteproof? <laughs> That's the term, hufteproof with a scooter, drunk, <laughs> proof. 
but in this setting, people would take care of it. And, and, and so we were able to sort of play with that. And there are two reasons why this artwork works. One is because it was accepted by the municipality and they sort of they cleaned the, the garbage out. And two is we um, give them a service contract, a maintenance contract. So we have always 10 modules spare. If there's something wrong, it's our own technology they call us, we repair it, etc. And this sort of makes it that it works. But it's a, it's a fragile ecolo ecology, it's a fragile understanding. But until now, knock, knock, um, it's up and running. And it's, it's quite beautiful uh, uh, how to see how this new type of interactive landscape work. Merging these, these, these uh, elements of nature and people and, 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 and landscape. And we're interested in sort of in sustainability. One of the biggest problems was to get the electricity somewhere for, for this artwork. You don't want to know how many people within the municipality are involved in terms of electricity. This seems, ma seems maybe like a banal, pragmatic topic, but you cannot ask a zip code for it, and they were like, who's going who, who to pay for the electricity, blah, 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 blah. And it was actually almost sort of killing the project. So what we did is said, okay, listen, there are five street lamps. We're going to close them down. Right? We're going to cut off the power anyway to make it dark. And we will make something which will give the same light as these five street lamps which we're cutting down. But we'll make it in such a way that it will only use the power of half a street lamp. So you will gain the electricity of four and a half street lamp. You'll make a profit. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was decided within two weeks to do it. I'm just telling you... It's about sci-fi, it's about poetry, yes. It's about how our world is changing, but it's also how to apply it, how to, know, how to sort of get it into the brains of these people who have to say yes. And I think that's a fascinating game. Um, 60 meter is using now 60 watts when everything is on, as sort of worst case. Uh, and we're sort of pushing that down as well. And that's a part of smart electronics, but also software, how many times you pulsate it in terms of that. And I was always a bit afraid if it was okay, in a way, the artwork. Because you place it there, eh, you spend three years working on it, and then you go away, and it's out there. You know, it's out there now. I, I don't know what's going on, and maybe it's something wrong. They don't see it, or they know, don't know what to do, and there's one guy always checking it, but maybe he's on a holiday, you know? I don't know. And I was sort of, I felt that that was sort of blocking my brain for the other project as well. So one day, I asked my great whiskets in the studio to make this SMS function. This is... Um, the, yeah, I changed the number so you won't do it, but uh, <laughs> this is the... <laughs> you'll get a miss, a miss June now, who's really mad at you <laughs> if you do it, but... Um, no. I can send an SMS to June right now, and then it sent me an SMS back saying, so many sensors triggered, these kind of moods, you know, so many people has crossed it. So it's sort of actually starting to communicate with me. So while I'm having dinner with a, with a nice girl, I actually get SMSs from my artworks, and she gets really jealous, and I have to explain it, and she doesn't believe me. <laughs> it's, it's getting complicated sometimes. But uh, I like that, that it's sort of, there was an emotional feeling, and then it, it comes up, it brings up a technological innovation. So we have been building these kind of new worlds, so to speak. Um, uh, fascinated, w really wanted to do something, not with LEDs after June, for the City Hall of The Hague, a piece called Flow, hundreds of ventilators rotating to your sound and your motion when you're walking by, creating these fields of transparencies and artificial wind, sustainable dance floor, a floor which generates electricity when you dance underneath it, existing out of two parts, harvesting energy, and a sort of interface style. The more you dance, the more depth it becomes, producing up to 20, 25, uh, watts per module, which is a lot, uh, which is l very little, depends what you want to do with it, but it was a first step of saying sustainability is not about don't do this or don't do that, but about activating, about participating in a way, creating this green, green ghost, which actually goes to the place where the most energy is produced, eh? so people would actually wanting to have it and dance more, which gave us more power to, to, to do stuff, eh? so it's sort of Win-win, that's a cliche, I know, but I'm going to say it anyway. And liquid space, this is actually right now in Gokbot in Enschede. We had the opening last night. I'm fascinated with making architecture which is more alive, move away from some of walls, doors and windows, and making spaces which would move with you in a physical way. And this is... Yes. This was a um, commission for the, um, a museum in Yamakuchi in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the West Coast in Japan, who said, like, we want something new from you. And so we did. And we were fascinated with making something that actually physically would move towards you. So these are some visitors uh, filmed from above. 
And we watched thousands and thousands of movies of jellyfishes before we built this. So when you're standing underneath it, it sort of slowly but surely moves towards you. Wop. It's actually quite scary. I actually convinced a Japanese journalist that it ate a, 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 a child. And she just <laughs> wrote it down, and we were laughing our ass off when she did it. But it's about the organic side of technology. You don't see the sensors, you don't see the wires, but it's moving with you. And they built a little crate for it. And then it started traveling. Here it's in Ural, in Terschelling, last year, previous year, I don't know, of the year before. Uh, placed in the, in the forest outside, where couples would come and standing underneath it, kissing each other like a digital mistletoe. Some people swear to me that it could read their aura, <laughs> which we like. We actually, we should have done that, you know, <laughs> it was, would have been much better. So that's our next project. But talking about how this new landscape could occur and how to also, within the, the Ural Schelling uh, setting, uh, where 60% where of the visitors grows their own vegetable and has no interest in technology at all. In a way, it's our, you know, our non-believing audience. Hey, I can say that, yeah, I can sort of, that's cliche-matic, but it's sort of... They, they, they are not sort of, they don't buy the new a iPad immediately, I think. And um, interesting to actually infiltrate there and to show that something which is artificial can become super natural in a way, can become the new natural as well, and, and to engage in that way. And the last project I want to show you, because I'm running out of time, is um, we've always been talking about technology as this, ins as, as this extension of our skin. But on one hand, I was like, I don't want to talk in metaphors anymore, you know, let's actually start doing it. And I was working with a, a facade company working on foils which would change in transparency. It's sort of an e-paper uh, uh, sort of dissident, um, uh, which we sort of teamed up with them to, to, to push it to a next level. And we started to make fashion of it. So Intimacy is a project where you actually try to merge what is already happening, how fashion or intimacy and technology is relating, and making dresses that the more intimate you are, the more transparent they would become. So to the right, it's still, it's quite hectic. And the other, it's sort of glowing. And Yeah, this. And on one hand, it's uh, maybe sci-fi and futurism, but on the other hand, it's not. Eh? In the same way as you, you blush when a nice girl looks at you, eh? your body starts to overrule what your brain says to you. Um, uh, it's about new skins, in a way, and how they can sort of merge together, making a black version as well. And this, we made a prototype. This is self-commissioned, no client, no budget, you know, just a lot of love and attention. And suddenly, it became a hit, and, and, and we're going to produce a lot. And one of the last projects I want to show you this is what I do the all day, like f testing freaky new materials, using with, oh, that's part of the job, um, new type of materials, everything heats when something gets warm or cold, it shrinks or, eh, or expands, this is a natural phenomenon, this is not something new, but we made it in such a way that it would be more extreme, making these walls called lotus, which would, when we would heat them a little bit with a lead in the middle, it would sort of fold open, sort of sometimes hiding and sometimes showing things. Um, really trying to make architecture more which, which acts like a flower, uh, less than, than, than a formalistic approach. Sort of to summarize, um, um, I'm showing you this project, you know, and I, I think they're not only about aesthetics in that way, um, or at least not if it's on my watch, so to speak. Because I think, yes, we live in this, in this changing world, eh? um, which is shifting from analog to digital. And yes, Madonna was right saying <laughs> that we live in, that she was a material girl. And I feel that there's a friction right now to that. Eh? That, that, that. This was an image I took last week from an intern. <laughs> it's sort of like, how can you say that? You know, that's a weird, wow, how does your brain work? Huh? I don't want to know. And I, so I realized that in a way, our world is becoming more artificial on one hand. It's still looking for this new default setting, like these fake cardboard stewardesses. Uh, at 2 o'clock at night on Tokyo, you know, which are really, really, really scary because they look real and then they're not. And you actually, you know. Um, and our society and our environment is already starting to communicate with us. 
like this, yes, yes, no, no, recycle this, recycle that. So in a way, it's already becoming proactive. Like, the, like uh, when you buy a book at Amazon eh, and it sort of starts making suggestions. Well, this will happen more and more and more also within the public space setting. And technology has always been part of our culture. And the way we sort of communicate with each other, our language, our imagination, our, our am amusement. And it's becoming slowly but surely jumping outside this microchip and embedding like these toilet seats in Tokyo with 35 different programs to do the things you do on a toilet, you know. Why do you put technology in a toilet seat? <laughs> I don't know, but it's something they, they feel really uh, precious of. And so we're shifting in a way, like 100 years ago, a staircase was something static, something which would never have imagined people to become dynamic. But now, if I take the, the metro in Rotterdam, the escalator actually starts running when I enter it. It's an extension of what I do. Um, I don't necessarily know how it works. It's also not important. But it's becoming an activator. And this was 1896. The first escalator was invented. You know, Where are we going to be within the next 10 years? And this is rapidly increasing. But at the same time, you know, maybe it's not about that. <laughs> maybe it's not about technology, and that's why I want to end up with today. I think the next revolution should not be a technological one, but a social one. You know, saying that tech within itself will make ourselves better or will solve the problems in our little world is saying that because we moved from black and white television screens to color, to plasma, to LCD, to 3D to HD television screens actually gave us better television programs. I mean, I would really guess again. Eh? So we have to sort of reinvent or reconnect this somehow. And this is now. We're doing it now. Huh? We, on one hand, are building this new world, this new landscape. But this is where the fun starts in. We're finally in the state of co-control. And this is where, in my opinion, the magic starts kicking in, in which we are building this new world, but at the same time, this world is also making us, it's sort of interfering, it's asking attention, it's sort of plugging us together. But let's sort of make it this time um, not something from top down, which a few little people decide in Silicon Valley, like, like Steve Jobs does, but let's make it this time an extension, maybe, an, an extension of our collective human skin. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much.